Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Garens. I'm an architect here in Vancouver and the chair of the West Coast Modern League. For those of you further afield who may not be familiar with the league, we are an independent nonprofit organization based in Vancouver that celebrates and advances understanding and appreciation for architecture and the allied arts on the North American West Coast with a special focus on the greater Vancouver region. You can find out more about us and what we do at westcoastmodern.org. Before we get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are hosting this event from both Vancouver and Whistler in Vancouver on the traditional ancestral and ceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Salawatuth, and Musqueam nations, and in Whistler on the traditional territories of the Squamish and Lillooet nations. We also acknowledge those traditional territories of Indigenous peoples wherever you are watching us from today. So thanks to all of you at home for joining us. On behalf of the League, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event, a conversation celebrating the work and legacy of a living legend, Cornelia Hahn Oberlander. Cornelia is arguably one of the most important landscape architects of the 20th century, a fierce advocate for socially responsible and ecologically sensitive planning for public landscapes, and a trailblazer in the realms of landscape architecture. Her contributions are not only renowned for having shaped the built environment of Greater Vancouver and indeed Canada, but also around the world. Today, we also celebrate the recently opened exhibition entitled Cornelia Han Oberlander, Genius Loci, on now through March 13th, the West Vancouver Art Museum, co-curated by Emery Calvelli and Dr. Hilary Letwin. Now, most of you hopefully received our announcement on Friday that Cornelia is not able to join us for the panel discussion this afternoon. However, Cornelia sends her warm wishes to everyone and her gratitude for the exhibition and the overwhelming interest in today's event. With that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists, whom Hillary will introduce in a moment, all of whom share a strong history of work and experiences with Cornelia that will make for a rich and fascinating conversation. Thanks to each of you for offering your voices today. I'd like to extend our gratitude to Hillary and the West Vancouver Art Museum for the opportunity to collaborate on this afternoon's event. And I would also like to offer a very special thank you to the Audain Art Museum in Whistler for generously hosting us on their Zoom platform. You can't see them in the background right now, but I would also like to say thank you to Kiroko Watanabe and Chelsea Louise Grant, my fellow League members, for their contributions to making this happen today. So it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's discussion, Dr. Hilary Letwin and to congratulate her for just a few days ago being officially appointed as the new administrator curator at the West Vancouver Art Museum. Hillary received her PhD from the Johns Hopkins University in Art History in 2014. Over the last decade, she has curated exhibitions at the West Vancouver Art Museum, the Burnaby Art Gallery, the Richmond Art Gallery, the Gordon Smith Gallery of Canadian Art, the Seymour Art Gallery, and has held curatorial fellowships at the Baltimore Museum of Art and the British Museum. Recent curatorial projects and publications include the Eyes Have Walls, Nicole Andre and Mina Tutino, Saints, Sinners and Souvenirs, Italian Masterworks on Paper, and Molly Lambovac, Talk of the Town. And as mentioned earlier, Hillary is also the co-curator of Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, Genius Loci. So welcome, Hillary, and please take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you, Steve, for your kind introduction and to the West Coast Modern League for organizing this event. Uh, I am the Administrator Curator at the West Vancouver Art Museum and one of two co-curators of the exhibition Cornelia Hahn Overlander Genius Loci. This exhibition opened last week in West Vancouver and will go on uh, to the Art Gallery of Alberta in Edmonton in March, where it will be open until August of this year. The Art Gallery of Alberta have been our partners in this project and my co-curator, Amory Calvelli, also joining us today, is adjunct curator there as part of the Poole Center for Design. After Edmonton, the exhibition will go on to a few additional venues, including, we hope, Toronto. Next slide, please. The majority of the material included in our exhibition has been borrowed from the Cornelia Hahn Oberlander Fonds held by the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. This project has been generously funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage, Government of Canada, with additional support at the West Vancouver Art Museum by British Pacific Properties Limited, Ends Gautier Landscape Architects, and Savemore Plumbing and Lighting Limited. 
I'm very pleased that we were able to produce a publication for this exhibition, which is available at our shop or online uh, for $25. If you'd like to buy it, the website is westvancouverartmuseum.ca slash shop. And I'll just show you a picture of the very beautiful Overlander orange cover. And now to the reason that we're gathered today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you from the unceded and traditional territories of the Squamish Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and the Musqueam Nation to our virtual panel discussion, marking the occasion of our new exhibition, Cornelia Hahn Overlander, Genius Loci. Next slide, please. Cornelia Hahn Overlander, born in 1921 in Germany, moved to the United States in 1939 and studied at Smith College in Massachusetts. In 1944, she began her studies at Harvard University, uh, working with Walter Gropius, among others, designing her first projects for the Citizens Council for Planning in Philadelphia, where she worked as a community planner. In 1953, she moved to Vancouver, British Columbia, with her new husband, Peter Oberlander, undertaking a number of municipal projects, including the landscape for Skeena Terraces here in Vancouver, and one of the projects that we have focused on in our exhibition. Next slide, please. 1967 saw the launch of her acclaimed Children's Creative Center Playground at the Canadian Federal Pavilion at Expo 67 in Montreal. Over time, Overlander would go on to design a total of 70 playgrounds in her career. From 1975, she began collaborating with Arthur Erickson, working with him on the Robson Square Provincial Government Complex and the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia, both here in Vancouver. She continues to create designs for universities, government, schools, and private residences, most recently completing her vision for the roof of the Vancouver Public Library, which opened to the public in 2018. Next slide, please. Overlander has been the recipient of many honors the Governor General's Award, the First in Landscape Architecture, as well as the Order of Canada and the Order of British Columbia. As a testament to Oberlander's legacy, the Cultural Landscape Foundation recently announced the Cornelia Hahn Oberlander International Landscape Architecture Prize. The Oberlander Prize is the first and only international landscape architecture prize to include a $100,000 award. The Oberlander Prize will be conferred biennially, and I know that we're all looking forward to um, learning who the first recipient will be this year. Uh, next slide, please. Cornelia was not able to join us today for this panel discussion, but she's asked me to read a message from her. Thank you all for joining this wonderful event today, co-hosted by the West Coast Modern League and the West Vancouver Art Museum. I had the honor of visiting the exhibition last week. How incredible to see all the work in one place installed in such a handsome fashion. I want to express my deepest thanks to Amory Calvelli and to Hilary Letwin for their vision, attention to detail and hard work that made this collaborative exhibition possible. Their sensitive insight to my work with so many projects shown here is truly impressive. I'm grateful that their passion for this work matches my own. I also want to thank all who contributed essays to the handsome book, in addition to Amory and Hillary, Eva Matsusaki, Susan Harrington, and Martine Devletter. These are colleagues with whom I have worked with many years, each person contributing their impressions on different facets of the projects. I thank Charles Birnbaum for his vision and leadership of the Cultural Landscape Foundation for documenting my work and for joining this conversation today. Sincere thanks also to the West Vancouver Art Museum and the Poole Centre of Design at the Art Gallery of Alberta, including all the staff members who have worked so hard to make these exhibitions possible in these difficult conditions. Seeing the work gathered in one place gives me much comfort, knowing that the ideas I have pursued over seven decades will continue to resonate among all of you, accompanied by my famous mantra of the four Ps, patience, persistence, professionalism, and passion. Many thanks for joining the conversation today and all the best for 2021. And that was a message from Cornelia. Next slide, please. For, day, for today, I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists, my co-curator, Amory Calvelli, Professor Susan Harrington, Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of British Columbia, 
whose book on Cornelia was published in 2013. Eva Matsusaki, an architect who worked with Oberlander on a number of different projects, both in her capacity at Arthur Erickson Architects and in Matsusaki Wright Architects, as well as Charles Birnbaum, President and CEO of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. And I would like to note that both Professor Harrington and Eva Matsusaki were contributors to the publication, uh, which I mentioned earlier. In addition to thanking our panelists, I would also like to thank our Zoom hosts for this afternoon, the Audane Art Museum in Whistler, British Columbia, who've generously lent us their Zoom account for this event. Next slide, please. Work on this exhibition started over two years ago when I approached Cornelia about planning an exhibition of her work. West Vancouver has long played an important role in the development of modern residential architecture and design. From the 1940s, the rocky cliffs overlooking the ocean have challenged architects to stretch their Bauhaus inspired designs to suit this dramatic landscape. Our past programming at the West Vancouver Art Museum has highlighted important homes designed by locals, including Ron Tom, E.C. Binning, Arthur Erickson, Jeff Massey, and Fred Hollingsworth, among many others. It seemed only fitting then for us as an institution with this focus on West Coast modern architecture and design to celebrate Cornelia Oberlander's considerable contributions to this field. Next slide, please. So I met with Cornelia on a sunny afternoon in February 2019, and we started planning. We spent many beautiful Vancouver days sitting in her living room, sun streaming in on her yellow walls, overlooked by art by BC Binning, textiles from Africa, and family heirlooms passed down from her parents. On these occasions, we spoke about her career and the exhibition, but also about her own experiences in fleeing Nazi Germany with her mother and sister, attending university at Smith College and Harvard, and her move to Vancouver in 1953, and the joys and challenges of raising her three children with her late husband, Peter Oberlander, who was an urban planner. She regaled me with a particularly funny story about sending Peter to the grocery store for oranges and him coming home with avocados. Apparently he was hopeless at household tasks. Peter's legacy, however, looms large in Cornelia's work and the deep impact that they had on each other's work is tangible. Next slide, please. And I'm lucky to have had my own partner in this endeavor in the form of my co-curator, Amory Calvelli. Quite early, Cornelia's family introduced me to Amory from the Art Gallery of Alberta with the hope that we would be stronger together. This fortuitous introduction led to a division of labor, which allowed me to focus on Oberlander's private residence and large public projects, and for Amory to focus on the social housing projects and playgrounds. Cornelia had a significant hand in helping us to pick which projects we wanted to feature in our exhibition, but the plan was to showcase projects from across Canada and from different phases of her career. And here in West Vancouver, we're showcasing 12 projects and the Art Gallery of Alberta will feature 15 projects in their version of the exhibition. It should be noted that an exhibition about landscape architecture is not always easy to present. How do we transport you to a place and evoke the true multi-sensory experience of the designs by Cornelia? Further, a number of Cornelia's projects no longer exist in their original form. Landscape architecture is among the most vulnerable arts given how easily a design can be altered due to the passage of time and risks associated with redevelopment. And at this point, we can end the slideshow uh, and um, shift to our questions. Uh, so we'd like to open our questions today with a discussion about how we all know Cornelia. We each have a, a personal relationship with her. Uh, and um, I would really like to hear um, from our panelists about how they met Cornelia and uh, we're going to go in the order of how long people have known Cornelia for. So we're going to start with um, Eva Matsusaki. Eva, can you tell us how you met Cornelia? Thank you. Um, it was in 1975. Um, Eva, Eva, I'm just gonna interrupt you because we can't see you right now. Do you want to turn your video on? There we go, we can see you. Yes, thank you. 
1975, um, we were both working on uh, the Robson Square project as it's known now. Um, and we had numerous teams. There were, um, there was the courthouse team, there was the government offices team and the skating rink team. And covering all of them was known as the skin team um, because right, the skin covering it. And uh, both Cornelia and I were on the skin team. And uh, within the architect's vocabulary, we had what was called slip and slide. In other words, every part of the building wasn't the same length. You always had to slide past. And um, so one day uh, when we were working on what we call the flying planters uh, that had to slip by the main building, the structural engineer said, well, what Cornelia had designed for these um, flying planters was too heavy and, and it just wouldn't work. And um, as architecturally, we wanted it to be a double cantilever. So it's off the building and long. And we debated and went many ways. And finally, Cornelia went away and was as her reputation, uh, she did research and came back with this lightweight um, growing medium. So then the engineer was happy, the architects were happy and Cornelia was happy. And um, so that was, and then I worked with her for 40 years. <laughs> so, so that's my introduction, thank you. And Charles, I think you're you're the person who's known her the second longest. <laughs> Can you oh, tell us how you met her? Well, you know, when I met Cornelia, I had a full head of hair, and um, sometimes I've wondered if she's had anything to do with uh, the current condition. But but all kidding aside, um, I feel like Cornelia has always been there. I, I I can't say specifically the exact moment because as soon as I started attending. ASLA conferences, and in particular, the, the uh, conferences that took place at Wave Hill, um, just in the Bronx, New York, Cornelia was always there. And Cornelia was always suggesting what needed to be done. And I thought just on a humorous note after reading Hillary's introductory remarks in advance of today, rather than quote a great scholar of landscape architecture, um, and recognizing that I was on a panel um, that was mostly gender female, I thought I would open with a quote by one of my favorite comedians, Amy Poehler, uh, to lighten things up a bit. And she says, I just love bossy women. I could be around them all day. To me, bossy is not a prerogative term. It means somebody's passionate and engaged and ambitious and doesn't mind learning. And for me, Cornelia was always this gravitational force at every one of these meetings that we sought out to be in her glow. And so I don't have a specific moment. I can always remember being drawn to the light and to Cornelia and to how she enlivened all of us and by extension, the discipline. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and Susan, you got to know her um, a number of years ago, too, I think. Yes, uh, we are actually uh, connected through Friedrich Rubel, who invented the kindergarten. And um, I was doing research in Germany on Frubel because Frubel had gardens in all his original kinder, yeah, his 19th century kindergartens. And I came up upon an author named Beata Hahn. And she um, was one of the first to sort of publish on his gardening activities as part of the kindergarten. And uh, she just stopped publishing in 1936. And when I asked the archivist in Berlin what happened to Bianca Hahn, they said, well, she just disappeared. And so I was really suspicious about this. And I'd always wondered what had happened to Bianca Hahn. Then years later, so this would have been about 2005, I was interviewing Cornelia about her Creative Play Center design, Expo 67. 
And at the end of the interview, I was thinking of her middle name, or her, you know, Cornelia Hahn Oberlander. And I said, you wouldn't happen to know a Bianca Hahn, would you? And she said, that's my mother. And so I knew at that point that I had to write about Cornelia, that she would be a woman whom history would not forget. And uh, so we embarked upon the book at that point. Um, so that was, a, that was how we met, really. And Amory, my, my co-curator, can you tell us how you came to be interested in working uh, on Cornelia for the exhibition? Yes, yeah. yeah. so um, I, I feel Cornelia has many admirers, well-deserved um, to have so many admirers. And I, I'd actually like to speak to the generosity of Cornelia's body of work because that's what drew me in. Um, there, there's nothing about uh, shoehorning design, if you will, into objects of spectacle. Um, if you visit a landscape, a garden, a rooftop of Cornelia's design, there's an experience that one feels of feeling connected to a place, of, of being of a place. And it's how we feel rooted. And each space that I have visited of hers has felt like a gift. Uh, so I was gonna just share a little anecdote um, that while I was at the Canadian Center for um, Architecture, the archive room, I was sitting at a table I was looking at some garden club drawings by elementary school children. And it was with these drawings that I started to understand what was the focus of, of the exhibition. Um, here were square foot garden plans drawn in Crayola crayon or pencil on colored paper, pumpkins, strawberries, radishes, corn, watermelon, blueberries. There were some forts that had pulleys to them. There were devices to twirl from. And then there was this one giant slide. It was a really tall chair with like kind of like a lifeguard's post. And then there was a teal ribbon that was uh, the slide, which was like a waterfall. And there was so much imagination in these drawings. And there was so much of a connection to things that are growing and how life evolves in the environment and ecology. And I had, I had already proposed an exhibition to uh, my director and chief curator, Catherine Crouston at the AGA. Um, but these drawings kind of informed a deeper question. And it was really, how has Cornelia's body of work inspired a human connection with, with the environment? And not just thinking about the urban dwellers, which of course, that's a very strong and part in part, but the children, the teenagers, the hard to house, those in the hospital, and those even who mobile around by wheelchair. Um, and as Hillary had mentioned, uh, she and I were introduced through Cornelia's family. And I would, I would just um, say that together, we've created a very nice back and forth process that allowed each of us to explore our ideas and uh, allowed us to layer upon each other's ideas and also stretch those ideas. So it's been a really amazing process. So. And just to round out the um, discussion, I moved to Vancouver 10 years ago uh, and shortly thereafter had my first child and spent a lot of time walking around the city um, with, a, with a stroller and a baby. And I kept coming across these urban gardens and would, would sort of explore them and uh, figure out who designed them. And every time it felt like they were being, they were, they were all Cornelia Oberlander <laughs> and they brought me so much joy as I got to know my new home that I vowed uh, to one day do a project about her. And, uh, and here we are. <laughs> so I'm uh, moving on to the next question for our panelists. Um, there are many themes that have emerged in this project as being very important to Cornelia's work, regardless of when, where, and for whom each project was designed. And one of these themes is that of play, uh, both as important to the design process and to the intentions of the finished landscape. Susan, your essay um, in our publication about being on the road with Cornelia um, for your book tour back in 2013-2014 um, also invokes the spirit of playfulness and spontaneity. Um, I also wrote about how Cornelia sees every interaction with nature um, as a potential learning opportunity. Uh, and in fact, during the first lockdown of 2020, uh, back in, in March and April, I would call Cornelia fairly regularly to speak with her. And uh, her first question was always, Hillary, what are your children doing right now? 
<laughs> and I'd explain, well, we're, we're out of school, we're locked down at home, and we go to the beach every day. And she got incredibly excited that we were having these beach outings because she said, really, children don't need manufactured playgrounds. What they need is a pile of sand and a pile of, of dirt and a pond. That's all they need. That's her ideal playground. And um, it, was, uh, it was wonderful the way she um, encouraged us to go to the beach every day, which we did uh, because Cornelia told us to. Uh, so um, this concept of play is really important in Cornelia's work. And I, I was hoping um, that some of our panelists could speak a little bit more about the importance of play in her work. I think you wanted me to go first. Um, so um, playgrounds was something that I was very interested in exploring. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Cornelia had designed 70 some playgrounds earliest one starting in 1952 uh, to 1954 with the 18th and Bigler Street Playground, which is in, in the exhibition, uh, moving to, uh, you know, 60s and 70s, and even up through 2012, um, a recent playground for the East Three School in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories. And I, I was interested in exploring how these playgrounds have evolved. And um, one of the things in 1970 in, in a discussion, a, a talk that um, Cornelia was giving to the Vancouver Board of Parks and Public Recreation, she defined play as, um, quote, play as an interaction between the child and their environment. And I think that's something that has really st uh, stayed with me, just um, the idea of using loose parts, building with sand, mounds, climbing, balancing, all of these different kinds of activities. Um, she was really employing the language of physical activity and social interaction and the research of educators. And uh, there, there were a series of periods of playgrounds, um, some being less uh, satisfying for a lot of designers. And, and one of those might be in the 1980s uh, when uh, playground structures started to become very concerned about safety and risk. And by the mid to late 2000s, uh, research of social scientists started revealing concerns about these standardized playgrounds. And one scholar in particular, Tim Gill, had studied risk in child development. And he describes the 1980s playgrounds as where the accident was seen as a sign of mismanagement or it was a bad thing. And then he goes on to suggest maybe we're playing it too safe. And he actually wrote a book about this. So it started to become the downside of safe playgrounds uh, was uh, forcing a developmental capacity associated with risk aversion. Uh, and so I think this is something that Cornelia never really fell into, like the idea of talking about a creative playground that encourages unself-conscious concentration. Um, and she talks, uh, she, she has always used ex um, different kinds of activities and different kinds of play and different kinds of social interaction um, in her playgrounds. Um, in the exhibition, there's one uh, kind of felt marker tip um, paper that as a ele an elementary school child had written. And this person wrote, quote, I would like an adventure playground because it would probably give Van Horn School something to do. The reason that I say this is because I'm always bored. And I think, you know, really uh, thinking about play in the wider sense. I'll just uh, leave with one image that um, really resonates with play for me and it's in the catalog. Um, it's a little boy holding his hand out and there are three caterpillars walking around the hand and the other two boys are looking on and this is actually an image from the North Shore Neighborhood House Playground. Um, but just the idea of play being defined in the broadest sense perhaps where her playgrounds are really a study in the physical and the emotional connection to a place, which, which I found intriguing. And Eva, I think you wanted to say something about play as well in Cornelia's work. Yes, um, I have thought that I, I would, I like being contrary. And so uh, I thought uh, there's so much emphasis on the play that I also wanted to uh, put out there that uh, there, there are many places that are um, peaceful and contemplative. Um, it's almost like uh, 
to me, it's almost like a Japanese garden uh, emphasis where, where you can just sit and be at peace. Um, and I think there are examples like that. Um, there are, are spots at the Robson Square um, top parts and a Museum of Anthropology are examples. Um, and I think uh, without going through the list, I, I, I think that's the point is that it's not just um, activity and play that, that there's also the flip side of um, a contemplative space. So that's, that's me, thanks. I think being contrary is playful, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a second theme that came out of our exhibition and out of the book project is um, really the, the priority of research. Uh, it's clear from the material that Cornelia engages in a tremendous amount of technical research, and this is something she was doing very early on in her career. Um, whether it was in the development of green roofs or the identification of ideal plants for a particular environment. And I'm hoping that some of our panelists can speak to ways in which Cornelia's research has been important uh, and to particular instances where her research may have taken her to surprising places. And Susan, I wonder if you can start us off with that. Sure, Hillary, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's been really the cornerstone of her, pro her whole practice. And in fact, Arthur Erickson said that she approached each project like it was a thesis. And um, there was a lot um, of, about her research around plants, about keeping them alive, about keeping them on structure. Um, I think one of the things that surprised me uh, in writing the book about her research was her community work. Um, after she graduated from Harvard, she went to work for the Citizens Council on City Planning in Philadelphia, where Edmund Bacon was really re-envisioning the city. And, um, she was um, making community gardens. She was leading uh, workshops, trying to get people's views in the community while they envisioned their neighborhoods. Um, she had Operation Fix Up, where she went in and, um, and helped people paint um, houses and plant gardens. She would bring people up onto rooftops and take them on tours of their neighborhood. Um, and she did this in 1950 which is absolutely amazing because I always think of the sort of participatory movement in design happening in the 60s and 70s. So here she was 10 years you know, ahead of, of herself. And of course it got her a lot of, uh, brought her a lot of attention. So Oscar Stone Rover saw her work as did Louis Kahn and uh, what, what just an amazing start to her career. And Eva, you had some great observations in your essay for our publication about the way in which Cornelia conducted her research. Can you speak a bit more to that? Uh, well, I, I found that uh, she would do research in the strangest corners where um, at the CK Choi building, we had um, what's known as gray water, right? Doesn't connect to the, the sewer system. And um, she found this man in Alabama, Dan, Dan in Alabama. <laughs> and uh, he helped devise this trench with uh, sedge uh, plants. And um, it was our way of filtering the water. Uh, and how she found this person, I, I don't know to this day, but uh, she would do things like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, Cornelia and her uh, longtime assistant, Elizabeth Whitelaw and I, uh, I don't know if you can see this there like that, uh, did this manual, introductory manual for uh, the um, public works. So here's sort of like the contrary, right? Here you, you got a government grant and then you find this obscure man and, and um, in Alabama. Uh, and so I think what other people have talked about is that her research spread very wide and uh, could have come from anywhere. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one other thing that I just found out uh, 
a few days ago um, from my, uh, my partner, Jim Wright, was that uh, up in the, at the Northwest Territories, right, as you can imagine, you're way up past the Arctic Circle and things don't grow very well. And they were trying to get some plants to, to grow and they just wouldn't, they, they wouldn't make it to pass, pass the seedling stage. So Cornelia said, well, let's put them on a plane and bring them down to Vancouver. And once they're big enough, uh, we'll ship them back. And that's what they did and it worked. <laughs> it's just like, where does that come from? Uh, but it's a wonderful story. So that, that's me, thanks. So Hillary, I might just make a couple of sort of very quick comments on this topic because it's something that is something uh, that is near and dear to both Cornelia and myself. You know, first of all, I think when we say research today for the young landscape architects that are watching today, um, often that means using the Google. And um, you know, for for it's important to remember that when Cornelia was a Smithy um, and she was in the Smith Library and she was raising a question about a book, the librarian pointed to the Dewey Decimal System to her and the Avery Index and said, get to it. And when we did the oral history, she told us that story, but also every project that she talks about always begins, and these are direct quotes, I'm not going to do an enormous amount of research on grasses for the green roof. I'm sorry, I'm going to at Van Dusen, or now I told them that I needed to get a lot of research because I did not want to do a playground with playground equipment at Expo. And in all of these projects, we have her to use her words in her three R's, you mentioned the P's before, that risk taking and research and responsibility all go together. And so to me, what's very interesting, and I hadn't really thought about it, Hillary, and um, until you posed this question to us, is I think that one of the things that I started to think about is when, when Cornelia came out of the GSD, um, the message that was delivered and it was recounted um, just a couple of weeks ago uh, in an interview with Carol Johnson is her favorite projects were those projects she got built. And I believe that in the same way that Halprin weaponized community engagement through Take Part, what Cornelia is also doing is she's weaponizing the research saying, here are the experts, they endorse my scheme, they're part of my collaboration. And so I think there's also a strategy of not just sort of risk taking and doing due diligence, but it's also buttressing getting the work built. She's stacking up the experts. And Cornelia, I know you're with us today and I hope I haven't gotten in trouble for that one because that's new territory for us. Thank you, Charles. Uh, an additional theme in Cornelia's work has been an early consideration of the perils of climate change, uh, which has subsequently taken root in the general population's conscience. Uh, we're also witnessing the persistent political struggles to meaningfully move the needle. I remember uh, an early summer visit to Cornelia pre-COVID um, when she took me outside to her garden and pointed out all of the dying hemlocks and she said that's a result of climate change. In Vancouver we're seeing our hemlocks um, uh, die because of climate change. Uh, can uh, some of our panelists speak to the ways in which Cornelia has consistently brought climate change to the forefront of your interactions with her. And Amory, maybe you can start us off with that. Sure. Um, I think uh, while I, I don't think we would characterize, I don't think Cornelia would characterize herself as an activist, she was very engaged in uh, how climate affects um, quality of life and also the ability to survive. And uh, just in going back to the research in the archives, each project has um, extensive uh, references to uh, people like uh, ecologist Aldo Leopold, who uh, wrote The Land Ethic, or Rachel Carson's Silent Spring from 63, or the UN Conference on human environment, um, uh, the Our Common Future report by uh, Norway's prime minister at the time, Bro Brundtland in 1997, that really blended the social, the economic and the environmental components together uh, was uh, changing for her. She changed her direction based on that. Uh, recently in the, um, 
the Climate of Man, a New Yorker series that was really extensive um, on uh, climate uh, change and the impacts was one of the files in her projects. So I think each project that um, she worked on brought forward questions about the environment and uh, the imperative of uh, the changing climate. And I'd, I would love to just point out the East Three School of the Northwest Territories. Um, I think this project in particular, uh, uh, Cornelia has recognized that the climate is changing noticeably in, in the North. Uh, she's referenced the idea of food security as being in a uh, severe and acute problem within the next uh, decade and a half to two decades. And uh, her response to that uh, is including uh, food knowledge and building um, ability for um, you know, people to berry pick or at least think of like the playground matrix of activities incorporated traditional hunting or uh, caribou hide tent making or um, berry picking for the kindergarten children. And so I think uh, taking the inspiration from what exists on the place with reference to food and then um, bringing it forward. And I know you'd asked what can individuals do? And I think our collective failure has been um, really not able to create a sense, uh, we've had a lack of urgency. We've not been able to create that sense of urgency and scientists and politicians have been ringing alarm bells since the 1970s, 1979 um, was when it's been marked where we've known about this. And I think while Cornelia might not be an activist, I think her work has helped to bridge maybe stronger connections uh, to the natural environment. And it allows, you know, uh, there's a sign in the gallery that you'll see that um, is an, a welcome school a sign for the East Three School students. And it says, um, we hope you will learn about the plants from your family and your community el elders. These plants of your own home have provided medicinal and have provided medicine and food. And so the idea of creating a place where individuals can start to connect with their environment more deeply, I think is maybe um, the role that I've seen her take on that. And Charles, I think this is probably something that you can speak quite a lot to as well. Well, it's interesting uh, to hear M Amory and I think about how our personal experiences have likely been very different in that I actually uh, aspire to be an activist at the level that Cornelia has been. Um, I wrote down just a few words. Climate change is so challenging to tackle in a, a, a 90 second soundbite, but here's what I wrote down. Lead by example, learn by doing, bust the boundaries and move the line, grab the microphone and state and stake your position steadfastly enlist and deploy a coalition or army and educate ambassadors at the highest level. That's our girl. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I just wanna shift slightly in, in Cornelia's hometown here in Vancouver, her contributions to our environment are seen as both reflective of the culture of this place and also reflects our strong relationship to the natural world. But it's also, I think, um, important to see her work as a substantial catalyst to how we collectively strive to build out our city with an intimate fit between architecture and surrounding land landscape. Uh, I'm hoping, uh, Susan, you can start us off by talking a little bit about how Cornelia's work uh, is seen in the international world outside of Vancouver. Um, how is um, how's her work also perceived outside of Canada? And Charles, perhaps you can speak to this, but Susan first, if you could speak. Thank you, Hillary. Yes, um, one of the things that uh, I realized uh, during our book tour was that uh, her audience went way beyond uh, Canada or the US. And in 2015, she received an email from Magnus Schoen, who was a landscape architect and architect um, in Sweden. And he invited Cordelia, uh, he admired her work for years um, to come and, and, and give a keynote lecture. Um, in uh, Stockholm. And it was amazing because Cornelia said, well, you know, we're on a book tour. Why don't you, I'll, I'll invite my author and, you know, we'll go together. And so the book tour went on just to Sweden. 
and uh, she had a huge following there. So this was a conference for Swedish landscape architects. Uh, the conference was called Oyster. And so there was hundreds of people there um, who knew her work. And apparently uh, the landscape architects had been studying not only Cornelia, but uh, Vancouver. And they really saw her as someone who had contributed in a significant way um, to, to the city in Vancouver. And they really wanted to model that. Um, approach to the urban landscape that Cornelia had really pioneered here. And so that was a real eye opener. And it was just amazing to see uh, the audience that she that she drew um, in that event. And I think, Susan, weren't you saying that quite a lot of that uh, landscape in, in Stockholm looked very familiar, because you realized so much of it was <laughs> modeled on Vancouver? Yes, they took us on a five hour walking tour. <laughs> Stockholm has a lot of watery edges and they were showing us all these new urban developments. I was like, yeah, it seems a little familiar because yes, for 10 years we've been visiting Vancouver and studying <laughs> the urban landscape. So it, it, it did certainly seem familiar. So um, Hillary, in tackling this question, a, a couple of observations. First of all, I think Cornelia and her work are um, inseparable in terms of being international forces. Um, I think many um, came to know the work through um, magazines and popular publications. I think about when I was in the private sector in the 80s after the museum, excuse me, when Robson Square was completed and everybody wanted to do stramps. Everybody was looking at this feature that Cornelia had crafted with Arthur inspired by a pram. But you know, for me, I think what, what I want to point to here in the question is really, I think, what makes Cornelia's uh, work so in, inspiring, and in particular, the two really career-defining, I think, projects at the Museum of Anthropology and Robson Square. Um, your question, the way it was uh, stated to us, was between architecture and the surrounding landscape. And I think what was so revolutionary about Cornelia is she didn't see the built environment that way. She saw the buildings as features in the landscape. And because of working on plus or minus 50 projects with Arthur and having continuing um, collaborations with architects like Eva, the, there's a, a seamlessness in the work between inside and outside and building architecture and landscape architecture. And for me, the power of the Museum of Anthropology, for example, is it is about the cultural landscape as much as it is about the design landscape. And it's the, the lifeways of those people that came through there. Um, it is the borrowed view. It is the subtle manipulation of topography. Um, it is how it all comes together and um, it's all one. And I think to so many, um, it was the way of seeing things and, and crafting it so meticulously that uh, inspired so many um, to pay attention around the world. Thank you, Charles. Um, I see we're coming up at about um, 50 minutes. And so I thought I would uh, take us to our last question, our final question, and then we'll open up the floor. We have a few audience submitted questions that we would like to address before we wrap things up. Uh, at, at the hour mark. So I'm hoping um, that each of you uh, can share with us uh, one of Cornelia's favorite projects from her career. Um, speaking about a specific project um, that you think could be considered either a major turning point in her career, or perhaps it's a favorite project of yours for another reason. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to open up the floor for people to share their favorite projects and tell us why. I can start if you like. I, I thought a, a really interesting uh, turning point uh, in Cornelia's career was her uh, the Creative Center at Expo 67. And um, you know, we talked a lot about her doing research and, and this was a, um, uh, you know, a place that was supposed to inspire children to be creative. And her design um, was really based on observing her own children and seeing how they like to play and how they like to move. And it started to change her conception of um, the body moving through space, through landscape. And 
um, it started to change the way that she designed because I think it really brought this idea of movement, of uh, interaction, the senses um, really um, to the child. And it was really, um, you know, I think when the project was first started, they kept referring it to the holding area because children would stay in the outdoor play space and then go into one of the rooms where they were to learn, uh, you know, how to play musical instruments or do other sort of creative acts. And, you know, Cornelia really talked them into making it a space in its own right, not a, a holding bin. In fact, the kids didn't want to go inside. They wanted to play in Cornelia's uh, landscape. Um, and was also very much um, a memorable uh, space for kids. I interviewed people who were in their 50s and 60s who remember playing in Expo 67 in Cornelia's landscapes. And to have a memory like that uh, your whole life of a landscape that you've created, I think is just remarkable. And I think, you know, one of the ideas that she, you know, got from it was that she brought the creativity out in the children. And, um, I think oftentimes when designers are creating things, whether it's architecture or landscapes, it's mainly about showing their creativity, but she really was able to, to successfully do that in that project. And, um, and again, I think it was a real memorable project for Expo 67 in the country. Well, I'll add my two cents worth and I was kind of, triggered by Charles's comment about the stramps. And I've talked to Cornelia about this. And I think um, what hasn't quite come across, um, I, I worked at, with Arthur for 10 years and Cornelia for 40 or 50 years. And, and an, one way is they were mentors. They, they get a lot of, um, attention and rightfully so because it's their firms but I've talked to Cornelia about this too it's the um, I just want to put it out there that that there are teams behind these people and and um I, I mean a huge can be a huge team and they they come up with the ideas and what I call optionitis you know, you'd put down two, three ideas and there was never one idea. You'd, you'd blend them or, or um, critique them. And that's where I think these people were really mentors, uh, especially to a, a younger crowd. And uh, I just wanna give them credit in that capacity and not as um, solo stars. Uh, anyway, that's a little contradictory, but that's where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Charles, do you have a favorite project of Cornelia's? So I'm, I'm going to answer this with two sort of little statements. The first really, um, and, and really, Hillary, this is as much to you as anyone for, for taking me to see Monteverde. And um, for all the years I knew Cornelia, um, I had not seen um, Eva and um, Arthur's and Cornelia's work there. And I mention this because it has only received scant mention in sort of the survey work. And I would suggest that, um, for, first of all, it's in the exhibition, which I think hats off because it will raise its visibility now. But we must publish about these places because if they don't, if we don't, they will perish. And I would, I would say that Monteverde would rival any significant uh, post-war modern subdivision with the best in the world. I think it's a, a masterwork, uh, the sleight of hand. Um, I mean, Hillary can testify to my goose pimples and my happy dance when I was there. But I also, um, today is very much also about love and our, our love for Cornelia. And for those of us that are in the discipline, um, there are no, you know, it's 24 seven all the time. And what I wanted to do is give a shout out to my, my favorite um, landscape feature is the water feature at the Museum of Anthropology. The decades that it took to realize the birthday gift for Arthur's 80th, um, you know, as part of all of this work, we realize and we know this, that very often it takes 
decades for a landscape to reach its full uh, vision of those that created it. And it takes steadfast stewardship and a deep understanding of place. And so for me, that feature is all about love and uh, generosity and collaboration between the kinds of teams that Eva was just speaking about. And so when I got to see the water there after so many prior visits, uh, I was so moved. And I say um, it is due to Cornelia's steadfast commitment, but it's also to all of those that she has touched who wanted to bring that to full fruition. And so that is my favorite landscape feature in an Oberlander Erickson project. And I feel like I've talked about uh, the, the East Three School um, a couple of times today. And so I'm going to claim that as my favorite, even though it's really hard to choose a favorite. Um, but I feel that um, it really, for me, sets a way forward in how we address our connection to the environment, to the land, to food, to survival. Um, and uh, I really, I find it a very inspiring project. And I, I think it really, just the idea of bookending from 18th and Bigler in the 50s on a square foot plot in an urban setting, a parking, you know, a parking um, space, uh, asphalt structure, and creating this amazingly intricate and uh, connected series of different types of activity and gathering and connecting for people. And the idea of the pocket parks that came out of that. And then this final one where there's uh, a full school of um, kindergarten to uh, you know, grade uh, high school students that are sharing a playground together um, and sharing the, the way that the vegetation grows. And we didn't really talk about invisible mending, but that's something that um, happened in, in that space as well, where uh, it connects with what Eva was talking about, about transporting the plants uh, to Vancouver and back, but um, that invisible mending of just picking up the soil and placing the things into it that um, are existing of the place. So um, it's, it's all beautiful work. It's hard to choose, but so I'm gonna stick with the one I've been talking about. Thank you, Amory. Um, we've received a number of questions from panelists, both in the chat function and also in advance of today's panel. Uh, and we don't have much time, but I would like to bring one question in for our panelists to answer. Uh, and then for those uh, panelists who have given us questions through the chat, I would encourage you to um, uh, get in touch with us so we can have some email conversations. Uh, so um, we have a question from Gary who wrote in a few days ago saying, this past year has seen unprecedented use of local public and open spaces as people have appreciated parks, gardens, green streets, et cetera, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions like gathering or exercising inside and traveling to other places. Do you recall any other time when the public as a whole were driven to appreciate these spaces to such an extent? And what would you suggest uh, landscape architects should do now to leverage this opportunity to design more healthy outdoor spaces for the public. And uh, Gary, I wanted to bring your question and I'll, I'll open it up to my panelists uh, in a second, but uh, I wanted to share with you that um, I had a telephone conversation with Cornelia uh, in the summer and, and we were talking about how she was doing and she said, this isn't the first time that I've been confined at home. Uh, and of course she was talking about her experience um, in, in prior to fleeing Nazi Germany. And I found that a very poignant um, observation for her to have made. Um, but I also wanted to say that uh, my children and I, as I attested to at the beginning, spent lots of time at the beach, but we also took a trip to the Museum of Anthropology in April, just as spring had sprung in Vancouver. And uh, the museum of course was closed, but the landscape was open. And seeing her work at the Museum of Anthropology was an incredible salve for the soul. Uh, and uh, it's, that was really when it struck me, just the potential of landscape architecture and design, especially in these very trying times. Uh, would any of our other panelists like to speak a little bit more? Um, Charles, perhaps you can say something about what landscape architects can do in the future. 
Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's apt to, to raise this question in the context of several of the comments made by the speakers for over 70 playgrounds in Cornelia's career. You know, one has to remember that when Cornelia was a student, as the other, you know, classmates like Halperin, when they came out of the program, they weren't designed, you know, they were shown playgrounds that were squares and rectangles that were plopped down on places, often behind a chain link fence, utilitarian. We know that Cornelia bemoaned this. And one of the things that's interesting to me when you think about almost any of these projects and those that have had controversies, think about the proposals that have been raised, some realized sadly at uh, Robson Square, all of those things that have happened have been for usually singular uses that prevent the freedom of movement through Cornelia's landscapes. These are boundless. And whether it's for, for children or adults, it is about having an openness. And those places that have not done well during COVID are in fact those traditional playgrounds that have all of the apparatus um, with that level of contact um, up close. And so I do think that this idea of grounding landscapes in freedom of mobility and being open, we've seen a resurgence of people wanting to be in nature in landscapes, um, both as um, active participants and observers from sa safe distances. And I think that um, when you look at a landscape like Museum of Anthropology, it's tailor-made for the moment that we're in. Nothing has to be changed and you can have that experience. And so I think it was there all the time um, by, by not being delegated to a singular use. Before we wrap up, would any of my other panelists like to speak to this? Seeing, seeing none. Uh, it gives me so much pleasure uh, to thank our panelists for their fascinating discussion today. Uh, the exhibition continues at the West Vancouver Art Museum until March 13th. Uh, we're open Wednesday to Saturday from 12 to 4. Uh, at the moment we're a drop-in institution and bookings are not necessary, but we do have a 10-person maximum capacity in the space and visitors are welcomed on a first-come, first-served basis. We're offering a virtual screening of the film City Dreamers, which features Cornelia as one of the four women showcased. And this will be on February 8th. And details for that can be found on our website under events uh, with a link that will take you to a place to buy tickets. Uh, my thanks again also to the West Coast Modern League uh, and the, Art, the Audain Art Museum for making today possible. Uh, and I'm going to pass the mic back over to Steve to close us up. Thank you, Hillary. Um, before we close up, I just wanted to read a message that we received uh, during the panel here from David Lieberman. Um, so I'll just read this. Thank you, Cornelia, for your work, for your sensitivity, for your wisdom, and for your inspiration. It has been 60 years since, as a youngster, I first met her in what became an annual ski vacation in Banff that our families shared. Cornelia and Peter introduced me to the challenges of architecture, to responsible urbanisms, to a respect for the environment, the magic of botany, and to the possibilities of the constructed landscape. My own career as an architect, as practitioner and academic now spanning 50 years, began with listening to Cornelia's stories, listening led to conversations, conversations that have continued with an animated exchange of ideas, conversations that have continued to be a source of pleasure, conversations that on occasion have been walks in the garden. With respect, support, and affection, David Lieberman. Uh, Susan and Charles, good to see you and to hear your thoughts and those of Hillary and Emery and Eva. So thank you, David, for that message. That was lovely. So, Thank you, Hillary, Charles, Amory, Susan, and Eva for a wonderful conversation this afternoon. Growing up in Vancouver, Cornelia has had such a tremendous influence on my work and design sensibilities, and I know many others. And so it's been really fascinating to hear your thoughts and stories about someone who is such an inspiration to so many people. Thank you again for joining us today. To the Odd Day and Art Museum, thank you so much for your support in making this possible. And to all of you at home or wherever you are watching this from, thank you for joining us today. The response to this afternoon's event has been wonderfully overwhelming. 
If you'd like to watch this conversation again, uh, the recording will be available on the League's website in the next few days at westcoastmodern.org. While you're there, you can also subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on social media to stay tuned for future notices about League projects and events. And so we'll see you soon and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks also. Good to see everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you as well. Very nice conversation. Thank you. <laughs>